theory of random matrices to statistical mechanics. But now we are going today we are going to change the mechanism of how we do lectures. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to challenge you with exercises, and then we are going to uh, to work in groups. Okay, and I, I will go around, and we have to solve between all of all of us the challenge I, I'm going to pose. All right, is that okay? And we'll see we'll see how it works. Good, and then we'll go. Uh, we are going to do a collection of exercises between all of us for the rest of the lectures. Yeah, so the first, the first three days, I, I, I needed them to give you all the mathematics and physical tools you need, and now it's going to be more, much more interactive. Good? Okay, so let me finish with the, with the replica method. Right, so, so we were... Where? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so recall, we have the following Hamiltonian. So I was trying to restrict the replica method by a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is a Hamiltonian of a Daisy model on, a, on graphs. So the Hamiltonian was the following. Uh, H of sigma is equal to minus j. And I put it directly like sum for i is smaller than j of c i, uh, c i j. The Hamiltonian depends on the connectivity matrix C. Sigma i, sigma j minus h, the sum for i from 1 to n of sigma i, right? Where well, remember that this is the adjacency or, or connectivity matrix, okay? Adjacency or connectivity, connectivity matrix. And what I, I argue, I hope you understood that, is that the object I want to do the average over this, the statistics of the graph is the logarithm of the partition function, right? Because the logarithm of the partition function is the cumulant generating function of the observables of interest. And the replica trick tells you that this, you can achieve this Average, which is very difficult to do directly as the limit when n goes to zero of one over n, uh, the logarithm of the n power of the partition function average over this order. Okay? And let me put here C. So far, so good. Yeah, then I tell you that this is this formula is, not, is the replica trick. The replica method is a number of steps. Okay, this would be, or this is what I, I would call personally the replica trick. And the replica method is a number of steps. Um, so step number one would be to take the partition function to the n power n bin integer and then do the average over the the quench disorder of the n power of the, of the partition function and step number two is to introduce an ANSAT introduce some hypothesis to make the limit n, n going to zero, right? And maybe there are some subtleties in the second step, okay? So far, so good. So yesterday, we finished for this Hamiltonian, where C is a connectivity matrix of random uh, erdos renyi graph or Poissonian graph, we found out the following. We found out that the, the average of the n power of the, of the partition function is equal to a sort of a path integral, dp, dp hat, of the exponential of minus n, s sub n, that depends on p and p hat, where s n P and P hat is equal to 
minus i, the sum over sigma p hat sigma p sigma minus d divided by 2, the sum over sigma over tau of p sigma p tau, exponential of beta j, a scalar product between sigma and tau minus 1, minus the logarithm of the sum over sigma of the exponential of beta h, the sum alpha from 1 to n of sigma alpha minus i p hat of sigma. Or something like this, yeah? And for the rest of the lectures, okay, before the exam, the gaps I, I, I left, we are going to do it together, okay? So just let me finish this part. Is that okay? Good? Well, and then, so let me emphasize this thing again. Sometimes in statistical mechanics, when you want to calculate the partition function of something, okay, apparently you start doing very crazy derivations, you start complicated things for no reason, for no apparent reason. And it seems like we were doing this thing here. You, you agree with me? <laughs> very good. Okay, the reason we do this type of derivations is the following. Yeah? We try to rearrange do the derivation in such a way that the partition function can always be, be written as an integral of a few number of degrees of freedom, right? Of the exponential of something that has a variable that grows with the system size when you take the thermodynamic limit. Why is this important? Well, because if you're interested in the typical properties or the thermodynamical properties of the system, if you manage to write the partition function in this way, then the thermodynamic limit is very easy to do, right? The only thing I have to do is I apply the silent point method. Compare this with the original definition of the partition function. What would be the original definition of the partition function? Well, this is what it is. Uh, the partition function would be the sum over all possible configurations of the exponential of minus beta Hamiltonian of sigma, okay? So this is the definition of the partition function. Imagine if you were not doing these tricks, and you want to study the behavior of this expression when the number of variables grows. Here, how many uh, sums, elements in the sums you have, two to the n, right? When n goes to infinity, so imagine how you can capture what are the most important contributions to this sum. This is very difficult to do, right? Even numerically, if you have of the order of n equal to 50 or 100, this sum, computationally speaking, is very diffi difficult even to, to evaluate. Right? So the tricks with it, do you understand this thing? The, the tricks with it, it was to achieve this. If you achieve this, the thermodynamic limit is very easy to do. Are you with me? So therefore, so now, I, we discussed the side point method for the simplest cases, okay? But the spirit of the side point method normally survives when you change the object over which you are doing the integral. This is very important. Here, the integral is is being done with, over a very weird object, so over functions. This is a path integral, although in reality this is not really a path integral, but let us call it that way. You know? So we saw that the side point method or the steepest descent method or Laplace method, depending on the function, it was a way to evaluate asymptotic behavior of an integral that has a, a parameter that grows in certain limit, okay? So remember that we started introducing this. We have an integral over a and b, dx exponential of minus fn, f of x, yeah? So here is simply an integration over one variable. Yeah? And here we managed to prove that this can be written, uh, that this is equal, sorry, this is not, this behaves asymptotically as the exponential of minus n f of x evaluated uh, at the minimum of the function. Yeah? Then we, we, we mentioned that this trick can be generalized when instead of having one variable, you have n variables. Yeah? Here, in principle, you have, if this would be a real path integral, it is not, you have an infinite number of variables, but you can do the same trick. So this would be a functional, which is functions of functions. You can do a Taylor expansion of the functional, 
and you could, in principle, apply the same idea. You would do a Taylor expansion of this guy around the saddle point, and then you can integrate the fluctuations of the function around the saddle point. So the same asymptotic behavior or the same analysis that you did to prove this, you can generalize it here, okay? So therefore, what? This one here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, remember that the, the notation, if you don't, if you don't understand notation, please ask me, okay? Remember that the vector with the, with the, with the, with the line below means a vector in the replica space. So this means a sigma one to sigma n, okay? And this would be another vector in the replica space. So tau, tau with the straight line below is tau one to tau and an annotation like this, the sum over sigma, what it means is the multiple sum for sigma one taking values minus one, one, up to sigma n taking values equal to minus one, one, and the same for tau. Okay, because when you, if you want, we can, do the, we can do the exercise to complete that part. But at some point, when you do the average over the, the adjacency matrix, you have a, 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 an expression of, of the following for, uh, sort. You have the sum uh, for, the double sum for i and j from 1 to n of what? Of the exponential of minus, uh, no, exponential of beta j, the sum over alpha from 1 to n of sigma i alpha, sigma j alpha. Do you remember this expression that appeared? What do you mean? So this is smaller, sorry. That this is, yeah, this, this sum uh, dummy index that runs from one the first copy to the second, uh, second copy at t until up to the nth copy. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. And these indices here are in the indices of the nodes of the graph. Uh, yeah, it happens because of the following, right? So, okay, so shall we do this uh, a bit the, the details of the derivation here? Hello? Do you want to do it? Yeah? Okay. So the, the reason it, it appears this double object here is because of the following. Okay? So let us do the, the derivation directly. Okay? So let me first put this thing in a, in a nicer way. This would be the double sum of i and j from 1 to n of the exponential of beta j. And I'm going to write this thing as the scalar product of sigma uh, i a scalar product with sigma j. Yeah? Is that okay? Very good. Now, this is equal to the following. This equal to the sum over a vector, generic vector in replica space of the sum for i and j from 1 to n of the exponential of beta j this generic vector in the replica space, a scalar product sigma j, a Kronecker delta, or, 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 that, or Dirac delta, let's put it Dirac delta if you want, it's better Kronecker delta, sigma vector in the replica space must be equal to sigma vector in the replica space for not i. So what I have, what I have, uh, I, I have done is the following, yeah? If I have a, a if I have a function that depends on sigma i, yeah, this is equal to the sum over sigma 
of delta, of delta chronicle of sigma, sigma i of f of sigma. Yeah? Is that, are you, are you following this? So you see, I'm interested in taking out of the, of the argument of this function, the index that appears in sigma. The way to take it out is I put just a, an expression of the identity using a Kronecker delta or a Dirac delta. And of course you can do this thing instead, instead of having just a is invariable, a vector of is invariables. So in such a way that if I were to do this sum over sigma, I can substitute the value of sigma for sigma i. Is that okay? So now you understand I can, I can do the same thing for this object here, right? So then this is equal to the sum over sigma, the sum over tau, this vector in the, another vector in the replica space of the sum of i and j from one to n of the scalar product of beta, so, sorry, of the exponential beta j scalar product of sigma i, sorry, sigma with tau, Kronecker delta of sigma, sigma i, Kronecker delta of tau, sigma j. Is that okay? Well, now, what is the i index and the, sorry, this would be sigma j. What is the i index and the j index? Before they were here, right? Couple, inside the argument of the exponential, and now they are beautiful, beautifully decoupled in the Kronecker deltas. In such a way that, let's see, I can write now the following. So now I can rearrange the sum for sigma and j, and this is equal to the following. This is the sum over sigma vector, sum over tau vector of the exponential of beta j, the scalar product of sigma with tau. And then I, I can put here, no, the following. The sum of i from 1 to n, the Kronecker delta of sigma, sigma i, times the sum over j, from 1 to n, the Kronecker delta of tau, sigma j. Yeah? Is that okay? Better? Now, this object, these two sums, are the same object. It's a probability distribution. So given a configuration of the spins in the replica space for different nodes, this is the probability of finding a particular configuration sigma in this, uh, in this, uh, in this statistics you, know, you do, right? So this, if I define now P of sigma as one over N, the sum for I from one to N of Kronecker delta sigma, sigma I, this is equal to the sum over sigma in, in replica space, sum over tau or replica space of the exponential of beta j, sigma scalar product with tau, multiplying by p of sigma, p of tau, right? That was your question? Good, more questions? Yeah, because this is, uh, since these are Kronecker deltas or Dirac deltas, so you can think uh, about this like a, like a a way to construct to construct a histogram in a, from a point of view of, uh, of frequency. No, for instance, uh, you have your collection of you have your graph. Well, you have a graph that has n nodes, and then you have n small copies of this, right? So, in one graph, you have uh, n nodes, and you have a configuration of sigma, sigma one, and then in a graph, and the n replica copy of the of the graph you have the configuration sigma n, yeah? And now suppose that you, you have this, uh, this system which is simply n copies of the original system, and this, uh, you, you run like a movie, no? And the, the, in each graph, the variables, the spin variables are fluctuating. And then you make a, a screenshot, and then you go and say, okay, how many spin configurations, yeah? When I go from graph to graph, they have Okay, a given value in replica space. So this counts how many configurations in each node 
are equal to a particular generic configuration in replica space. So this, this will give you the probability of finding a given configuration in replica space if you look at your collection of graphs. Yeah? So that's why it's a probability distribution. More questions? Ah, no, it went uh, somewhere because I forgot to put it. Yeah? Thank you very much. Yeah. In the final expression, instead of having an n squared, you have an n because you have d divided by 2n. Yeah? Good. More questions? Okay, so, so let me continue with the replica method, okay? Just 10 more minutes and then we start doing the, the mappings and exercises uh, in groups. Uh, so, so we arrive at the fact that the uh, the end power of the partition function average over the quench disorder can be written as a path integral dp dp hat of the uh, exponential of minus n s sub n p p hat. All right? And if you are interested in the asymptotic behavior for n being very large, this will behave as the exponential of minus n this functional or this function evaluated at the values of p and p hat that are the streaming of this uh, functional. I call those values p, p naught and p hat, p hat, p hat naught. Okay? So these guys, uh, p naught of sigma, p naught hat of uh, sigma below, sigma uh, are such that the variation of S sub n with respect to P uh, sigma is equal to zero, and the variation with respect P hat of sigma is equal to zero, okay? This condition is equivalent to the condition of the, that we saw in the side point method for the function. Right? So the, the derivative of the, the function at x0 has to be 0. Or the gradient of the function at a vector, a particular vector, has to be 0. It's the same thing. The same condition, but now it's for a functional. Okay? So these are called saddle point equations. And I'll, I'll leave as an exercise. Go ahead. It's a variation because your degrees of freedom are the values of a function when you vary the independent variable. Yeah? So in the path integral, again, so this is not really a path integral because the, uh, the function takes values on a, uh, takes values on a, on a finite set, okay, because the, the replica vector, the vector in the replica space has a finite number of values, but just for simplicity, I call, I call it a path integral, right? So, what you are doing, this, in reality, what it means is that I'm integrating over all possible values this function takes when I'm, I'm varying the argument. And the argument is the values of the, this vector in the replica space. Yeah? So if you, want it to be, if you want me to be more picky, yeah? so maybe what I should have done is the following. To define you that actually this P, what it really means is the product over all possible values of the vector in the replica space of d, p, sigma, right? So this sig vector sigma in replica space is a, is a way of labeling the different values of the function p, and the same one for p hat, right? Okay, so my, the, the variables I have to minimize over this function S are precisely all possible values that this function and P hat can take. 
Right? So that's why I, I, I do a, instead of putting partial, I, do a, I put a delta as a, similar to what you do in calculus of, of variations. Is that better? More questions? Very good. So um, if you calculate the side point equations, I told you that you get the following. Yeah, from, from the expression of S, you should get that P0 or minus I P0 hat of sigma is equal to D, the sum over tau of, blah, 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 blah. Mm, yeah, P of tau exponential of minus beta J scalar product of sigma tau minus one. Yeah, with here P0 and P0 sigma is equal to what? It's equal to, uh, that's right, it's equal to the exponential of beta H, the sum for alpha from 1 to n of sigma alpha minus I P hat 0 sigma divided by the sum over tau of the thing that you have in the numerator. Right? Is that coming from the Yeah. Shall we, let's do something. Do you want to start doing the, the exercises, maybe? Do you want to do this? Hello? So, uh, so, have you tried to do the, the derivation of the Salpon equations? Who has tried to do it? Have you managed to do it? Okay, so let's do the following. Okay, let's do the following. Let's start. Okay. And then we do the mappings in uh, as I exercises later on. Okay, so let's do the following. Let's go backwards in the difficulty or the, the way I presented the exercises. Okay? So let us do first exercise. One that we are going to do now, all of us, between groups, discussing is to derive this, all right? So, so let me remind you, what you have is the following, that uh, Sn of P, P hat, is equal to minus I, the sum over sigma, P hat sigma, P sigma, minus D divided by two, sum over sigma and tau, of the exponential of beta j the scalar product of sigma tau minus one p of sigma p of tau minus the logarithm of the sum over sigma the exponential of beta h sum for alpha from one to n of sigma alpha minus i p hat sigma. And again, okay, so this might be a scary object, but in his deep soul, okay, it's a function inside the argument of an exponential, and you have to apply the side point method. So the object, it might be a bit more complicated, but the spirit of the method is the, is the same. It remains, right? So from here, I have to calculate the functions P and P sigma for which the variation of this is zero. So I have to, I have to take the variation of, sig of S with respect, you know, a certain value of the function for a given value of the independent variable, P tau, and equate this thing to zero, and this with respect to P hat as well. And this should give you these two equations. All right? Go ahead. Is there a sorry? Well, I think it has to be it has to be half sign for both times. The exponent of the first equation. I have to so yesterday you wrote it with e to the plus beta j. Ah yeah, no, this ah this one? Sorry, yeah, it's plus, sorry, sorry. Yes. Thank you. More questions? So shall we start with this exercise? 
So we are going to do something that's called active learning. So active learning follows the, uh, it, it works as follows, okay? So you turn around, you look at each other, so you, you form groups of students, and you are going to discuss between yourselves of the way of doing this derivation, and I'm going to go around to see how you discuss and how you solve this problem. Is that okay? And uh, so let us, let us take like 10 minutes to do it, yeah? 10 minutes, 15 minutes to do this, and then we do, uh, we do all the other exercises. So you see, the, the, the first part of this exercise, okay, this way of, of, of proceeding is, again, you turn around, you look at each other, and you form clusters of students. And remember that Mateo said that you are scattered into masters and PhDs or something like that, diplomas, so maybe you should mix and match, right? You have two replicas, okay? N is equal to two, right? So this vector, so the, the, this thing of writing down very simple examples, believe me, is very, very useful to learn things properly, right? So sigma in replica space would be our, now sigma one, sigma two, yeah? So how, how many values this vector in replica space can take? Four, right? So sigma, the sigma now can take the values, uh, let's put it like this, uh, plus one, plus one, uh, and put it, let me put it just with the signs, no? Plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, right? Is that okay? Everybody with me? Very good. So now, Look at the first term I, I have here, and write it down explicitly. Here I would have, for this one, uh, minus i sum over sigma, uh, sigma p hat sigma p sigma. This would be what? Minus i uh, p hat uh, plus plus p plus plus minus i p hat plus minus p plus minus, minus i, p minus uh, plus, p minus plus, minus i, p hat, minus minus, p minus minus. All right? Yeah? So what I'm doing is in this, in this calculus of variations, but again, it's not really a calculus of variations because the, 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 the variables take uh, a finite number of of values, okay. but anyway, I'm just abusing language here. What I'm doing is, I look at this, how this function f depends on the possible values these two functions take, right? And then I took one of them, for instance, p plus plus, and I look at how this function depends, uh, varies when I change p plus plus, right? And I do the same thing for all possible values of this function, yeah? So, how this thing is encapsulated in notation? What I, what I do is the following. I take this function S of n of p and p hat, and I, see, and I look at how it varies when I take a particular value of the function p when its argument is equal to a given value of the vector that I call here, for instance, tau. Okay? And if, or if you want, sigma prime. All right? This sigma prime, in this case, will take four values. Plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, minus, 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 right? And then I do the derivation, okay? So once this is clear, okay, for a particular case, you can easily generalize for any, for any case. So let us do it, right? So this is equal to what? Um, so no, you see P appears here and here. In this part, it doesn't appear, so let us forget about this part. So this is equal to what? This is equal to minus i, uh, the variation with respect p sigma prime of the sum over sigma, p hat sigma, p sigma, uh, minus, uh, plus, sorry, the variation with respect to p 
sigma prime of this part here. Huh? That is, this would be minus d divided by 2, the sum over sigma over tau of p sigma p tau of the exponential of beta j, the scalar product sigma tau minus 1. Right? Is that okay? Now, in this sum over sigma, this sigma plays a role of a dummy variable. You know, it runs over all the values this sigma can, uh, can take. In this particular case, it would be four values. For a, a generic n, would be two to the n values. Okay? So at some point in this sum, you are going to have that sigma is equal to sigma prime. Right? You, and you can write down this thing explicitly as we did it here. So when sigma is equal to sigma prime, you can do the derivative of the value that this function takes when sigma is equal to sigma prime. And this will give you what? This will give you p hat sigma prime. In the same manner, you can do the same, here, the same thing here, but you have to be a bit careful. Here, you have a double sum. At some point, one of the elements of the first sum, sigma, would be sigma prime. And then at another point, tau would be equal to tau prime. Right? Is that okay? So then you do the, this derivation. And you, will, you would obtain the following. Okay? You obtain that this is equal to minus i p hat sigma prime minus d. You have divided by 2, but you have here two p's. Okay, and at some point you'll have to de do the derivative of this and then the other one, right? So you have uh, the sum over, for instance, uh, tau of p tau of the exponential of beta j. Remember, notice that this scalar product is symmetric, okay? That's why you have two times, two times the same thing that cancels this one divided by two. The scalar product of uh, sigma prime with tau minus 1. Okay? And the, f the couple of functions that obey this equation, the, these are, you know, the, the, the point that extremize, and we call this thing the P0 and P0 hat. Okay? So this would be P0 and P0 hat. All right? And the same goes for the, to, when you derive the other side of the equation. Better now? Yeah? Let me see. What's up? Yeah, you equate this thing to zero. So this is the, the variation. This equal to zero. Yeah, we'll give you the cell point equation. That was the question? Wait a second, please. Can you speak up? Did sorry? Hey, please one second. I, I can I cannot listen to her. Sorry. How do, do I get this? Yeah. So you see here, sigma prime is a particular value that this vector in elliptic space can take. Yeah. In this sum, this sigma uh, runs over all possible values of this vector in the replica space. So at some point in this sum, sigma is going to be equal to sigma prime, right? So when, when in this sum sigma is equal to sigma prime, the derivative will give you, in this case, p hat sigma prime, right? It's like, for instance, in this expression that I wrote down here explicitly, if I were to do the derivative when p, when sigma is equal to plus plus, the p of sigma, what I would get? p hat plus plus. Okay. More questions? Uh, you have to speak up. Uh, don't we have another P in the second sum, which is P of uh, the Here? Yes. No. So b because you are doing the one, of one derivative with respect to P, and you would cancel one of the P's, and you always one word would remain, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so there is another proper way to do this thing, a much more compact way, which is the following. is to realize that, 
Let's do, let's do it now with this trick, okay? So this derivation, you would do it thinking about what it means to do this, this, this variation, right? Now, a way to do it in a more compact way is to realize that if I have P sigma and I have P sigma prime and I do the variation of P sigma, sorry, this with the uh, arrow below. If I do the variation of P sigma with respect P sigma prime, this is equal to a Kronecker delta when sigma is equal to sigma prime. Why? Because this, the values of these functions, they are like independent variables and you are doing the derivatives with respect to them, right? So this is the generalization of having a set of independent variables, x1 to xn, and then you do the partial derivative of xi with respect to xj. This is equal to Kronecker delta i and j. The same, th the same thing here, okay? So what you can do now is to use this trick to do this, deri this derivation, right? Questions? No? Okay, so let, let, let's do uh, one thing because I, I need to, uh, to finish the explanation of the replica trick, the second step, but I'm going to do that when we apply it, we start doing the mappings to random matrix theory or problems in random matrices. So let us do the, uh, let us now uh, interchange, do an exercise of a, of a mapping, okay? And then we'll come back to the exercise I, I left. So I'm going to pose you the, uh, the first challenge which is the following one. So the challenge is the following. Suppose I have an ensemble of random matrices. Okay, this is an ensemble of, ensemble of matrices. Okay, and uh, let us say that A belongs to this ensemble. And let us assume for simplicity, for, to, to start that, this is an ensemble of symmetric real matrices, right? So this is an ensemble of matrices which are uh, real and symmetric of size n times n, right? So A is equal to... Uh, a transpose, yeah? Is that okay? Now, let me denote, given a matrix uh, A, let us denote like uh, as follows, lambda vector of A, the spectrum of A, okay? So that means the eigenvalues, right? Where this notation, this lambda vector of A is equal to lambda one. A, lambda, and A. What's up? A belongs to the ensemble. So this ensemble is a back where you have a bunch of matrices. This means a matrix for, from this collection of matrices, right? From this ensemble. Good. Now let me, uh, let me define what is called the empirical spectral density. So I introduce the empirical spectral density uh, that is denoted as, I'm going to do it like rho, so pay of lambda is equal to 1 over n, the sum i from 1 to n, Dirac delta lambda lambda i a. So this would be the, like this, the, if you have the, the, the eigenvalues, this would be the collection of, of eigenvalues constructing a histogram, something like this, yeah? So far so good? Yeah? Now, what is the challenge number one? Challenge one corresponds to the first mapping, mapping one. To realize that the spectral density, given a matrix A, 
this empirical spectral density it can be written in terms of a partition function of a system of n particles interacting. Okay? What's up? Yeah. The big N is the same as the size or uh... Yeah, this N is the is the size of the of the matrix. You have an n same matrix, yeah. so that means it has n eigenvalues. Yeah. And here I'm doing the sum over all eigenvalues of the Dirac delta when lambda is equal, is lambda is equal to a particular value of the No, it's it's just a, the, uh, somehow it's, 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 this captures the density. So how the eigenvalues are spread in the real line. Yeah? So if the matrix would be very, very large, yeah? imagine that the matrix, uh, the size of the matrix goes to infinity, you'll have a bunch of eigenvalues you know, in, in the real line, and this will give you a profile of the eigenvalues in the real line. Yeah? So for, for, for finite n or for a small n, this is just a collection of uh, Dirac delta peaks. But for n large, this, this will give you a profile of, uh, of, the, of the density of eigenvalues in the real line. Yeah? So, so let me put it differently, okay? If I were to take this, yeah? So what this thing means, if I were to take this, do the integral, do the integral in a particular, in a particular do, do the integral in a particular interval on the real line, this would be the number of eigenvalues values in the interval interval a b right so then this captures the, the idea of the density of eigenvalues in the real line they are degenerate yeah yes is the fraction very good because this is normal so it's the fraction this would be the excellent thank you is the fraction uh, of eigenvalues, thank you. Or if you want, put here the n, right? And then it's the, it's the number, yeah? Very good. Okay, the, the, no, this is a very, very good question. Okay, so sometimes, okay, and we'll see this. Sometimes, uh, okay. If I, okay, the idea is the following. That's a very good point. So if I, if I can diagonalize the matrix and I have the, the collection of eigenvalues, why, why I want to do this thing? You are absolutely, absolutely right. Okay, but sometimes, okay, you don't have access directly to the eigenvalues. Yeah. So if you were have the eigenvalues, I put this definition. Yeah. But sometimes it's not possible to calculate the eigenvalues. But I, but I have the, the expression of the matrix. So what I'm going to show you is starting with this definition, I can rewrite this as an expression that depends on the matrix. And when, and when I do the average over the ensemble of matrices, I get an expression of, of the spe spectral density, even though I cannot diagonalize the matrix directly. OK? No, 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 no. The, the, this is, this is a start with the, this definition. No, because if I have the collection, you know, so what I'm going to teach you it has no value, right? So starting with this definition is to rewrite this in such a way that I can compute this thing without having to have access to the knowledge of the eigenvalues. You? Good? Excellent. Very good question. Now, so let me go back to the challenge number one or the mapping number one. What's up? <laughs> As for like the ensemble of matrices, you said I would do an average over the ensemble of matrices. Yeah. So the idea is the following. So the ensemble of matrices is just a collection of a certain number of matrices, right? So what I'm going to do now, well, later on, not now, okay? We'll do this thing later because we don't need for the mapping is the following, okay? So I'm going to assign a probability distribution in this ensemble of matrices. Hey. I'm going to apply a probability distribution in this ensemble of matrices that will tell you what is the probability 
that if I put my, I, I take the, you know, I take one of these mat, one, I pick one of the matrices, okay, randomly, I, I, I take a given value for that matrix, all right? But now it's, this is not needed. So No, what would, uh, that's a very good, very good point. So what you, what you will have is a probability distribution for the matrices, and in some cases, depending on, on the ensemble of matrices, you can derive exactly what is the joint distribution of eigenvalues uh, that uh, is inherited by the distribution that you assign to the matrices. But in, some, in many cases, in other type of uh, matrix ensembles, you cannot derive this expression uh, explicitly. Okay, for instance, if this would be what is called the GOE ensemble, which is the ensemble of Gaussian orthogonal matrices. That would mean a square matrices where the matrix entries are Gaussian variables. One can derive exactly what is the joint distribution of eigenvalues. But if this would be the ensemble of uh, Poissonian graphs, nobody can derive the joint distribution of, of eigenvalues. Right? More questions? Okay, very good. So what is the challenge? The challenge is that to show that this can be related to, uh, let, let's put it like this, a spin glass problem. Where A uh, plays the role of the, or of the, the entries of A, play the role of interactions between spins, between quotation marks, right? And more precisely, uh, the spectral density is related to somehow the expectation value of a, of a local observable, right? What's up? We are starting with the simplest mapping, okay? So the simplest mapping is for symmetric matrices. Uh, we are going to do it also for uh, non-hermitian or asymmetric matrices, right? So this is the challenge, okay? This was, this disappeared, okay? Uh, in a paper, I'm, I, I'm going to give you some hints, right? So there's a paper by Edwards and Jones, 1974. And it tells you how to do this mapping. So part of this, uh, when we work in group, is to know how to search literature. With this, this is very important for research. And the tricks you have to do to go from here to here are the following tricks. This is very simple. We, have, we are going to use two tricks, OK? One trick is that the, uh, there is a relationship that the Dirac delta can be rewritten using the following identity. One divided by x minus i eta is equal to the Cauchy principal part uh, plus i pi Dirac delta. Okay, that was in the limit eta going to zero plus. And the set of trick you, you need to use is that the given asymmetric matrix, one over the square root of the determinant of a symmetric matrix. This is a symmetric matrix, okay? This is equal to the integral uh, of a bunch of variables. Of the exponential of minus one half, sum over i and j, from one to n, x i, k i j, x i. Uh, sorry, this is S. Okay? With zero plus, yes. Just using these two tricks that I explained, one should be able to express this in terms of some sort of partition function, okay? Where the uh, the entries, matrix entries play the role of interactions between 
random variables. What? No, no, no. This, I wrote down this thing. You have to work out there, yeah? The only thing I, I, I wrote down here is this identity. And just to remind you that this has to be a symmetric matrix. When you do a derivation, it might happen, maybe yes, maybe not, that the matrix A is this one here or maybe something else. You have to work it out, yeah? Clear what we have to do? Sorry? Ah, sorry. Uh, it's a spin glass type of problem, okay? Where the, where the entries of A, they play uh, the role of the interactions between spins. And when I put quote, quotations, it's like this is not really a spin glass, this is not really a partition function because maybe the, the, the exponential is complex, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But functionally speaking or mathematically speaking, it has the same mathematical structure, and that's the important, uh, the important bit. Clear? So what time is it? Okay, so let us uh, give it 15 minutes to try to, to work it out, be, uh, working in groups. Is that okay? Go ahead. Ah. So again, you work in groups and I go around and I help you with this. I tried, we tried yesterday, like, spent too much time on it to prove the fact that we have the one over determinant of A, which is equal to, for the complex case, basically project and so on. Yeah. For Hermitian matrices, it's obvious you diagonalize and you have unitary transformation, everything is okay. Uh -huh. But for non Hermitian case, like we found. For Hermitian case, the only thing you have to do is to do a, a, a linear transformation. You have to realize that actually, and this is in the book of San Justin, okay, that the couple of variables you put, the CI and the CI bar, are, are independent variables. Yeah. They, are, they are conjugate one of one of the yeah. other, but they are not complex conjugate. Yes, they, they are. Okay. They are. It's just a way to represent two. That's right. That's right. That's right. So you can take a transformation over one set of these variables to a new set of uh, variables, say like for instance, CI. If suppose that you want to transform Actually, the C's. We did it, but we ended up with something like uh, in the end exponential minus uh, when we did the transformation C T. Z prime transformed like, and here it is not the quadratic form. When yeah, but okay, but yeah, but uh, that's okay, no? Because so 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 think about it. Take that formula that I gave you in the simplest case, where the matrix S that has can be any matrix is simply the diagonal matrix, and then you have the sum of minus the sum for i and j of c i bar c j. Mm -hmm. you, you are telling me that this expression, this, this intra is not well defined. This is not true, right? Because in this sum, you would have a diagonal term that is real, and the other diagonal terms that maybe they, they are not, they are, they, uh, they oscillate, but the diagonal term is going to make that the integral converges, right? So even we still have the complex parts, we don't care about the complex parts. It's just well, it's not that you don't care. It's that the, 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 the existence of the, of the, of the integral is given by the diagonal part. And then how do you compute like, the ah, you, determinant of A? There is like sure, what you, what you can do is 